Hi everybody! Today we will take a journey into the heart of Thidin Kai, a land of rice, jewels and adventure. In 1444, its fertile paddies were trampled by two armies locked in conflict. Honsai and Ma Huang, together with their respective Kai allies, fought each other in an existential battle over the vestiges of the venerable Baihon Xin Empire. Din Kao Ban, camping in the city of Ma Huang, the living emperor was in civil conflict with his father, the rightful ruler of the same empire. Emperor Sang Kao Ban, leader of Honsai, was no simple man. In truth, he was no man at all, but a ghost which refused to pass over to the world of spirits. During his life, the palace had been full of supplicant foreign emissaries, loyal nobles and most dear of all, his three lively sons. Now, the halls were empty, but for the spectre atop the throne. In the months prior, his spies had uncovered a plot between his sons to split the empire in three upon his death. Sang was a learned man and knew that this would plunge Pai Hon Shin already weakened from the loss of its economic center to a pirate incursion into yet another period of warlords, one from which it may never escape. Seeing no other options, Sang made a very hard choice. The lives of his sons were a heavy price, but a worthy sacrifice to preserve unity. Summons were sent out to his sons for a grand banquet in Tuan Kao Ban, a final farewell from father to sons, just not the way they would expect. When the feast was wrapping up, Sang excused himself, for he could not bear to witness the deed being done. Although the deed would avert a future strife, it was also true that it left Sang careless. Even if he did manage to sire one in what little time he had left, there was no chance he could give them a proper upbringing. He needed more time. Calling his most loyal mystics to a meeting in secret, they arrived at a solution to this problem, an ancient ritual brought from Bomdan long ago. A thorough cleansing of the body the lighting of a special incense, a ritual knife infused with magical energies, and an unshakable will to live on. A month passed before Sang awoke again, now an ephemeral being of righteous fury. No longer shackled by the limits of a mortal body, he could bring about an empire to last another thousand years. Unfortunately, things did not turn out so easily. The executioners had let his youngest son, Dean, escape his fate. Dean had fled to the northern city of Mahuang and was already rallying an army to take Tuan Kaoban. Apparently, he had made extensive connections within the administration of the empire and many nobles were flocking to his cause. The Republic of Kudet Kai was also openly supporting Dean's dynastic claim. In the frenzy that followed this revelation, Another blow had arrived. The puppet king of Nagon to the west had raised his own army and declared independence, knowing that Honsai could not afford to contest his insubordination. Kaoban Sang had not conquered death to give up now. It was time to call upon his remaining allies, the warrior women of Qian Bin Hrung, for war against the last of his flesh. The Kom Inhabitants of Honsai had battle in their bones. It had been this way for centuries. The tactics, cohesion and drill of the great spear hosts would always win the day. On the opposite side, surrounded by foes, the Kudet Kai and Ma Huang troops had the maneuvering and the numbers advantage. Being able to potentially operate together, they could wipe the separated armies of the Ghost Emperor and their allies from the map with relative ease. Matters turned from risky to critical when the dwarven hold of Verkal Ozovar decided to join the fray and send the armies of its vassals, 18,000 strong, to the central Thidin Kai plains. The small jungle lordship of Hebat Hari decided to assist Honsai in exchange for the promise of help to retake their lands from the Pinghoi pirates to the south. Their 5,000 troops were more than welcome, but could they really tip the scales against the advancing Dwarven troops? Month later, the Sirtani offered a deal. 
These tribes were made of fierce cavalrymen and would be indeed an invaluable asset in the war. Their proposal was a stop to their border raids and immediate assistance to the Honsai armies in exchange for full looting rights during the war. Additionally, the tribesmen would be allowed to loot whatever they pleased after victory was to be achieved. Sirtani were known for their cruelty and barbarity, but in times as dire as these, their immediate help was more than necessary. Through focus and unity, the allied armies of the Ghost Emperor hunted the spread out regiments and army groups under the traitor's banner. Hill forts held strong and rice paddies were drowned in the blood of combatants as Kao Ban Sang's coalition marched slowly and methodically to the north. The Thidin Kai plains were a perfect staging ground for the ruthless Sirtani riders. On Sai's efforts of liberation were followed by brutal raids and heartless pillaging, as promised to the desert tribesmen. The jeweled matrons held their front in an exemplary fashion too. Their northern borders were particularly inhospitable for the Kudet Kai vanguard. Once the Sirtani joined the war, Chi and Bin Hrung's troops were free to connect with their allies and join the main offensive. In 1448, Rebel Sun was finally caught and put to death as the executioners should have done at the feast from years before. Kao Ban Sang decapitated his son in the throne room, ignoring the pleas for mercy from his surviving followers. The war was over and Hon Sai was victorious. Unfortunately, the great temple of Ma Hoang was severely damaged during its siege and it was plundered by scoundrels. The ambassador of Qian Bin Hrung was present at the peace talks and they took revenge on the Kudet Kai for the desecration of their former queen's body. They annexed the city of Nirak Von Kai and its surrounding farmlands as well as the coastline formerly held by their rivals. The Phokao mountain dwarves were subjugated, overlords turned vassals, the dwarves were going to be busy rebuilding their ravaged hold in the foreseeable future and their anger would eventually dissipate. Hebat Hari was sent aid for their loyalty in tax revenue and manpower and the Sirtani were allowed to ravage the reconquered lands to the horror of the local population. In time, these people would forgive and forget, for such was the way of the righteous path. The mind of the Ghost Emperor could finally focus on the true task at hand, to channel his fervor on reviving Bai Hon Shin and lead his nation to reconquer lost glory and influence. With the advent of peace, the armies would be free to rest and recuperate, replenishing their stores and refilling their ranks. They would train and drill in their barracks until the Emperor would once again call for their service. The internal strife was over, but the realm was ruled by an immortal spirit of a deceased king, passed from life but not from the mortal plane. Only their sheer force of will allowed them to remain here, bound to the palace, incapable of leaving the throne. This had led to a lot of problems for the state itself. Unrest, lack of stability and diplomatic reputation, as well as generally increased autonomy of the controlled territories. A long-term solution had to be found as soon as possible. One of the first solutions on the path to reformation was the construction of the Omniopticum, the Emperor conscripted a number of prominent engineers and architects to install mirrors in his throne room which soared above the city of Tuan Kaoban. They would allow the ruler to survey the city at his pleasure. He had also decided that certain machines were to be installed in his palace to allow him to monitor his capital as closely as possible. The spirit on the throne could work all day and night and that's all he did for the betterment of his capital and of his realm. The ritual that bound him to reality was the product of his fury and his will, both greater than any other man's. But in maintaining that tie, he needed the help of the mages. They suggested an artifact that used the magic stone Tamphora as a concentrated power source to feed his being. Unfortunately, that blue stone was incredibly expensive, but they thought they had a lead. The damaged high temples in Mahuang leaked a similar magical signature, indicating that they had Tamphora in their foundations. Certainly, somewhere nearby, there could be a mine that could serve the Emperor's needs, 
And with that in mind, the army was employed to help the mages estate with their great survey for a source of the magical material. In less than a month, the bored guard detachment of a mining expedition made a wonderful discovery. They took up small games to pass the time, kicking stones along the road as they walked. A small breach of discipline, but minor. And when one of the pebbles exploded in light and sound after being kicked, it was proved to be extremely fortuitous. From the pebble, the miners were able to identify a small seam of Tampora, and they started setting up extraction facilities in the province of Santun, halfway between the temple city and the capital. They could not be sure how long it would last, but every shred of the mage stone would serve the ghost emperor's cause. His concerns were not limited to maintaining the tether to the mortal realm and the improvement of his throne room. His broken realm had to be repaired as well. The treacherous Nagon had to be brought to heel, but even worse, the young pirates that plagued the south coast of Halles were enslaving the emperor's subjects and raiding his lands from the mouth of the Komma river. The Ping Hoi may have had respect for the spirits, but did not care for the lives of the mortals they oppressed. Their presence was intolerable and they had to be reminded that it was Honsai who ruled in these lands. A promise to the jungle realm of Hebathari had to be kept too, and the pirates would be forced to return their rightful lands as well, to the joy of their little allies. Wars are always costly, in grain, supplies and human lives, but the rewards from the coffers of the Yansheni Corsairs were greater indeed, and the loot obtained was used to construct a mighty magical tower in the capital city. With the concentrated power and the expanded Tampora mines, great artifact could be devised to bind the Emperor to the world more effectively, so he could concentrate on the necessary work needed to reforge his domains. Was this artifact a sculpture, a tool, a religious symbol? The contraption that the mages dreamt up had elements of all three. There, the motifs of a high temple, here a filigree of precious metal, though they claimed it was all for the purpose of harnessing the Tampora at the relic's core. Even Kauban Sang might not have been able to decipher quite how it worked, but they knew that when the Ghost Emperor touched the device, it began to hum and the smile slowly spread across the Sovereign's face. He had the will to lead Honsai, now he had the means as well, though even this binding would not last forever, and they had to do more to ensure his reign persisted, to avoid succumbing to chaos once more. An anchor to reality was achieved, and the inner circle could observe the strength of their liege's tether to the mortal plane. This strength had to be maintained at all costs, and the Emperor's existence had to be prolonged by whatever means possible. Great rewards could be gathered before the final passing of the Spirit Lord, if he would be able to finish the work he planned to do in order to strengthen the Empire and his journey had only just begun. The spirits had a world and the mortals had their own, but in Halles they were closer to each other more than anywhere else. Straddling both worlds was a tremendous feat, and even if this was not beyond Kaoban Sang, it taxed him greatly. Through spirit binding, shamans were more closely associated with the shunned left-hand path. There had to be someone out there who knew how to ease the bridging of the two worlds. If they would find one and adapt their efforts, they could maintain the Ghost Emperor's vitality longer. For this purpose, scouts and messengers were sent far and wide across Halles to search for a mystic practitioner of spirit binding. Another idea came from a Thidin Kai legend that told the tale of an immaculate gem that fascinated spirits and drew them in like moths to a flame. When they would come close, it would trap them, enforcing a bind to the material plane. The spirits would then wreak havoc and the gem was blamed for many earthquakes and mudslides. Whatever the truth of this story, a gem such as this would immensely benefit Sang, so adventurers were also dispatched to learn more. There were many peoples in Honsai, and whatever faith they professed, almost all also had their own peculiarities. Each family paid heed to their own set of spirits, and each had their own spin on the rituals of life and death. One thing united all of these people though, they were subjects of the Ghost Emperor. 
As a spirit, he could inspire their faith. As a sovereign, he demanded their loyalty. A daily ritual of homage was demanded from the people to help with his binding to the world. But even the most loyal citizen did not take kindly to having their traditions interfered with for a spectral leader that they could never see or understand. Their descendants would eventually learn that their sacrifices were not in vain. In two months since they were dispatched to look for a mystic, scouts returned with an answer from a man named Dio Sao. He was found in a small village of Honsai and offered to help. He was of a humble stature and never spoke above a low whisper, but he grew increasingly intense when discussing spirits. He was also surprisingly knowledgeable about their binding. He claimed a number of rituals could help Kaoban Sang to maintain his form. All he needed were reagents from seven different countries, a small sack of gold for his expenses, a large bottle of the best wine in the land, and freedom from any interference that might interrupt sensitive rituals which could unleash a spirit's wrath on them all. He also asked to have students brought to him. Sovereign's advisors agreed and set up an autonomous community in the coastal province of Pakpon Haitri. Whatever the scholar and his pupils were doing there was kept secret, but his rituals did help the emperor's willpower in the short term. On a larger world matters, the diplomats of Honsai approached the monk masters of Jiang Liu Si to forge a military alliance. Honsai would benefit with great help against the traitors in Bom Dan and Thidin Kai, while the Xia would accept any help against the towering hobgoblin threat to their north. The Nagon lands were invaded to be added back to the realm, and their treacherous prince captured and summarily executed. Adventurers attempting to find truth within the legend of the Gem of Fascination were led to Qian bin Hrung. Perhaps this was no surprise. Where else would the gem wind up if not in the home of Halesi's greatest jewelers? Thankfully, it was not yet added to the matriarchy's holiest of sites, the petrified queens of the Na Nanuhuangha temple. There, every queen who has ruled the country laid, their flesh turned to stone and studded with gemstones. Instead, the gem of fascination was located in the private collection of one of their wealthiest jewelers, who would undoubtedly part with a treasure for a fee. So an emissary was sent to ask for the price. Yet her reaction was puzzling. As soon as she received the emissary, the jeweler informed the queen of Qian bin Hrung and refused to part with the stone no matter what Honsai offered. This ancient relic had to be obtained. It could have been the difference between Kaoban Sang enduring or not. So the spy masters began assembling a team for an undercover mission to retrieve it. Following the annexation of Nagon, the realm was made whole once more. Kaoban Din's rebellion was a momentary but immensely traumatic rupture, splintering three peoples that had once been one, the Kom, the Phonan, and the Gon. Cultural capitals of Mairuk, Tuan Kaoban, and Hubai Mong found themselves on opposing sides, ruled by three monarchs who claimed to be independent from one another. In 1456, all three cities accepted the sovereignty of one single power, Onsai. Harmony and balance were thus achieved. Remarkable in both life and death, the emperor retained his iron will and had been known to compel lesser spirits to do his bidding. He had amassed a number of courtiers in this manner and intended them to be hosted in a series of temples across the realm, built for that specific purpose. Through the spirit network, he could make direct contact with these spirits and attain a more accurate assessment of the larger realm, its strengths and weaknesses. The network of temples turned a sovereign of men into a lord of spirits, who would listen to him and obey. This was proven by the faint glows surrounding the palace in Tuan Kaoban. Many reported hearing orders delivered by spirits walking in their dreams or appearing during temple visits. The ghost emperor's will spread and his people were bound more tightly to glory as it did. An unusual diplomatic victory internally. The Baihon Shin once defied fate itself, routing Jaher's forces and saving southern Hales from his foreign empire. Since then, many have tried to recreate the alliance of old. 
but it has always faltered, shattering into feuding warlords. Through strength of will and with the help of loyal subjects and allies, Cao Ban Sang completed the reunification of his people and succeeded in retaking the primordial role of defender of Thidin Kai. Onsai was no more a regent empire in name only. The Kai townships and rice fields could proudly arbor the flags of Pai Hon Shin with a renewed sense of tradition and with greater ideas of an ideal future. The splendid rebirth of Pai Hon Shin and the aftermath of the common victory against the pirates of Ping Hoi brought the empire closer to the chiefdom of Hebat Hari more than ever before. Driven by admiration and trust, their chief, Hijin Pu proceeded to Tuan Kao Ban to swear a solemn oath of loyalty. He entered the throne room, knelt before it and placed his crown in front of Sang before backing away. The deed was done and the crown was earned, not through conquest, but through fulfilling promises and through righteous deeds. Hebat Hari would henceforth fight as a loyal march alongside their spirit sovereign. A reform of the government was also quite necessary. The Ghost Lord was immaterial, but his time in the mortal world was still very much limited. Proper institutions for the future of the realm were needed. The estates submitted lists of demands in exchange for their support of the reforms. Of course, they each wanted more power, who could expect anything else? Nevertheless, their demands were met to a T and the Grand Congress was announced. When the day arrived, delegates from all estates gathered in the west wing of the palace. Bribes had worked and everybody important attended in person to this event, later called the Ghost Congress. They all came prepared to milk the state even more than promised, but made a critical error in their plans. Most of the people present had never met the Ghost Emperor, and as soon as he entered the venue, everything was in his control. His presence demanded absolute devotion to one single cause, the development of Bai Honshin, and to take revenge on all who wronged it. As a just ruler, the Ghost Emperor granted the promised privileges, but denied all further inquiries, of which there were only a very few. After a very efficient and productive meeting, the Congress ended totally in favor of Kao Ban Sang. The people left invigorated by the spirit of Bai Hon Shin and were now fully dedicated to the cause. It was done. At long last, the revolts from both traitorous kin and unfaithful allies had been put down, and the lands of Bai Hon Shin once more knew tranquility and the prosperity of just rule. That, however, was not even the height of their accomplishments. They had at long last brought true unity to the lands as never seen even in the days of Jaher's foolhardy attempt to conquer the great nation. In 1460 it stood as one and it was well prepared to see that nothing shall ever shatter this unity. They would be ready to beat back every moat of darkness and show all Halles true righteousness. This was the effect of the Ghost Congress and the Kai people rejoiced. But Kao Ban Sang never forgot that an hourglass was draining while he lingered in the mortal realm. With his people content within Bai Hon Shin's borders, he could finally put his grand plan for the future of his empire in motion. Each step of the plan would bring more and more rewards for the realm after his final passing, and each of them was just as important as the others. There were many interlocking mechanisms of the realm that needed to be understood and repaired. First and foremost, the Empire had to figure out how to carry on the legacy of the Patriarch without his presence. All the estates and famous families gathered in the capital city of Tuan Bai Hon Shin. They all met in the palace to honor the Ghost Emperor and to discuss the time after he left the mortal plane. After a week of feasts and other debaucheries, where they plotted and made alliances, they finally all met in the Grand Hall of the Palace to debate about the future form of government and submit proposals to the Ghost Emperor. Sometime later, they presented two options. One was the Twin Emperorship. They could keep the Ghost Emperor nominally as the ruler of Bai Hon Shin, but install a co-emperor to assist the Ghost Emperor, who would deal with the affairs of the mortal plane. The other option was the Ghost Council, a form of republic where the Ghost Emperor would still be nominally the head of the government, but every estate and all the powerful families would have a seat in the council. 
electing a new councillor to represent them and function as the head of state. They eventually chose to be a republic, where a council would rule as a proxy for the ghost emperor, but the voice of the people could also be heard. Then, the coast needed to be reclaimed and secured against the plague of pirates that roamed up and down the Halesi coast. Coastal defenses needed to be built, a strong navy needed to be released at sea, and then war had to be brought to the pirates of Prukakin and Pinghoi. Forts had to be constructed on the northern border, silk production had to be increased for the economy to prosper, and then farms and food stores needed to be prepared to house a powerful army, ready to withstand any dangers from the outside. For quantity and quality to be achieved, military reforms needed to be carried out to keep the pace with technological innovations from all around the known world. The Kai people of southern Hales also had to be granted refuge and safety within Bai Hongxin's border. From the Xia to Qian Bing Hrung, the people of Thidin Kai would eventually had to be brought together through peace or conflict. Unfortunately, the long alliance with Qian Bin Hrung was shattered by the agents sent to steal the gem that would aid the Emperor to stay a longer time in the world of mortals. The agents successfully infiltrated the jeweler's facility, but that was as far as they got before things started going wrong. Agents tried to sneak into a very guarded area and had to ambush a local patrol. Then. While inside, they had to troll through hundreds of gems to find the one they sought, discarding mountains of wealth for a priceless treasure. In the end, guards caught them in the act. A few men deserted with pockets filled with rubies and sapphires, while others died fighting the Binghrung forces that gathered to punish them. Only a few agents escaped. Even though they successfully salvaged the gem, they have forever ruined the alliance and earned the deepest enmity of Qian Binghrung. A very important part of the plan related to the citizens and their education. They had to be given the chance to always better themselves in understanding the world around them and the spiritual tools to live in harmony with the spirits. They had to be taught about the grand mission of the Ghost Emperor and about his benevolent vision of the future so that in their daily lives and through their rituals they would honor this vision and make the world of the living a better place for all, for this was the will of the Protector. Kao Ban Sang's ghost epic was written to join the tales of Lemang Chetta, who stood against the army of Jaher, and the story of his son, Ka, who bound Bai Hon Shin together with a mighty fist after the elf's demise. Poems dedicated to the Ghost Emperor were spread far throughout Hales, to ensure all knew of his deeds. The high temple complexes were rebuilt and facilities for hordes of pilgrims were constructed to aid their quest of spiritual enlightenment. To Ankauban itself, the jewel of the south had to become a city of stories and an example of blessed prosperity. The Sirtani raiders allies of convenience in the past, became a nightmare for the well-being of the people in Hebat Hari. The Sirtani plains would eventually be punished for their raids, and the Sirtani people would learn how to live in peace from the gentle Hebat Hari. Nothing seemed to be able to stop the Emperor's plans from succeeding, but with every passing year, the urgency to fulfill these plans became even more urgent. Sometimes the goal justified the means, and magistrates from the empire who visited the jungle tribe reported that Hebat Hari had a large contingent of shamans and other spirit-attuned practitioners, many of whom had to know rituals that could support Kaoban Sang and bolster his tether to the mortal realm. These people had to be forced to attend to an Kaoban and the needs of the emperor, which violated the agreements of autonomy put in place years before and angered the tribe significantly. Even so, they did remain true to their oath, despite the abuse they had to endure. Kai warriors fought alongside the tribesmen of Hebat Hari from the dark jungles in the south to the gates of Sermaya to the north, and the two states became ever closer than a hundred years of tribute could ever pay for. Chieftain Tinkir visited Tuan Kaoban in 1497 to celebrate a recent military success and walked with Emperor Sang in the palace gardens. They talked about the future and about ways in which the empire could assist them more. Hebat Hari had the chance to become more than a tribe of the Lupulan and instead a true state of their own. 
The Loyal March was rewarded with economical benefits and with wise counsel from the statesmen of Bai Honshin, so that they could bring prosperity to all the people of South Hales. A great sadness gripped the Emperor when he was forced to break another alliance with his warrior monk friends. In order to truly unify the Kai people, Xiaqian had to renounce lands populated by the Sikai. They would not grant them freely, so a war was fought for a handful of provinces, all in the name of the greater good. All things end, and yet nothing ever ends. Such is the truth of the world. Though the Ghost Emperor was ready to leave, unlike his traitor sons, the Kai would never abandon his legacy. That much was certain. In 1501, almost 60 years since his existence as a spirit lord, his quest was finally over. No matter how blazing the noon, the sun still sets. No matter how strong the tree, it someday falls. And though the Ghost Emperor was a spirit like no other, an unparalleled monarch, his time had passed. The Kai were left with his legacy. Resolve, will, the path to follow. The time for rebuilding was over. They now stood proud as the foremost nation in southern Hales. They united the Kai people, defended their shores, reinvigorated trade, and were one of the main cultural centers of Hales. The streets of Tuan Kaoban and of the other large cities were bustling with activity, selling all kinds of exotic goods. Year after year, the vassals came to the capital to pay tribute to the Ghost Emperor and honor his legacy. Time had come to consolidate their power and look beyond their strip of land, maybe even over the big sea. The Grand Republic of Bai Hon Shin, whole and resplendent, was ready to stride into the future as it would see fit. Passing of Kao Ban Sang and the gift of his rule offered them the tools to safeguard their people and to spread their influence wherever they would choose. The Kai people called the Republic home, but other Halesi did not. For that reason, the Republic considered that it was important for different cultures to exist autonomously within the borders of their chosen states. These states, if they would clash with Bai Hon Shin, would have to be turned into allies by force. One such troublesome states was Kapte Teleni, who absorbed the mercenary practices of Lot de Kang, home of the mercenary noble Daulofs and Halesi's greatest arena. They played a minor but important role in the destiny of Bai Hon Shin. They rejected alliance, so just as Jaher won their loyalty by winning one of their great tournaments, so it seemed that only force would teach them their place. Such wars were a sad tragedy in a brutal world. But the Kai army engineers learned artillery techniques from the dwarves in Verkal Ozovar, and their cannons, even if not as elegant as the dwarven ones, were definitely a sight to behold on the battlefields of Bomdan. Not being able to use the spirit messenger network anymore, without Kao Ban Sang, the state had to build a proper postal service to transmit messages across the land, to facilitate trade, governance and tactics. Another consequence of the past was Dio Xiao's school, the meek scholar who took up residence on the coast of the empire decades past turned out to have created a nightmarish community of horrors which have finally come to light in 1506. Initially there were conflicting reports, which were to be expected of the few terrified souls who have abandoned their ancestral homes to escape the left-hand path's influence. Some spoke of abductions, people simply not returning home after a day in the fields. Others spoke of nightmares beyond nightmares, dreams with evil spirits from which they could not wake. There was something very wrong in Pakmon Haitri. A small force was sent to the province and they found little in the way of the left-hand path. Any malefactors melted away like smoke in the wind rather to confront the soldiers. And the situation seemed to quiet down enough that priorities shifted from investigating rumors. But that did not last long. A massive force of sorcerers emerged from a hidden school, slaying the local magistrates and wreaking terror on the inhabitants. The deal made with Dio Xiao was ended, and so too was the Kai's patience. 
The left hand path army of darkness had to be destroyed so that such moral and spiritual decay would never happen again. As if a giant had walked the land while trailing a finger in the earth, the Republic had carved a mighty furrow in Mahuang. But it was not merely a channel for boats and commerce to pass along, no. It also featured a system of pulleys to help in loading cargo. There was even a canal side market to allow goods to be sold almost as soon as they were offloaded. Already trade was flowing easier, and more was yet to come. Tolls were taken and businesses were booming between the necropolis of Bimlao and the ports of Aravkelin. Cotton, silk, gems, sirtani horses, incense and tropical wood for all. A Canorian merchant wrote in 1654 about what he saw in his travels across southern Halles. 17th. After an arduous voyage around Sarhal, we finally arrived at our destination in Chai Kam Sin the main trading port of Pai Honshin. It was an exhilarating sight. Small fishing ships to great warships. Port was full of activity. Aside from some other Canorian ships uh, loading their cargo with cotton and silk, I saw bulky trade ships hoisting the flag of different Yansheni nations. Elven ships from the Far East and curiously, even some ships hoisting the pirate flag. Local sailors told me that uh, they were serving under a subsidiary of Pai Honshin, protecting their interest and harming the competition. <laughs> Unfortunately, my stay here is only short and I have to take a small riverboat to Tuan Kao Ban to accompany a diplomat to meet uh, with the president of Pai Honshin. The 20th of the 6th The trip to Tuan Kao Ban was short and we arrived early in the morning. What a sight to behold! Stories told in my hometown don't even come close to describing the splendor of Tuan Kaoban. The river port was located a bit outside of the city. As soon as we arrived, a diplomat from Pai Honshin welcomed us and took us to a messaging station to give notice that we arrived. We then took a wagon bringing us to the front gate of Tuan Kaoban. We drove through lush fields ever watched by the mighty Fort Taibo, looming on the hillside next to the capital. After entering the city made of stone, the diplomat left us together with the head of our delegation to meet with the president for negotiations and I got the rest of the day off. I took this free time to explore the city. My first destination was the University of Tuan Kaoban, famous for its diverse curriculum and freedom of opinion. While on the way there I saw a military column dragging along multi-barreled artillery walking in perfect tact. I spotted at least Three different temples, some for religions I haven't heard the name until now. The city was bustling with humans, elves, dwarves, harimari, gnomes and other races. Gnomes I heard took up residence here to freely pursue their interest in artificery. They installed light in the main street to keep them illuminated even during the nights. After taking a tour around the university, visiting the economy department where I listened to a class regarding trade flow and the artificery department seeing machines I'm not able to comprehend. I took a stroll through the Grand Bazaar. Mercenaries from Lot de Kang were recruiting new recruits and people from Hebat Hari dressed as if they directly came from the jungle sold exotic spices. After buying more than I was able to carry alone, I went back into the inn to get a good night's sleep before I am finally able to see the Grand Palace of the Ghost Emperor tomorrow and meet with the President, the ruler over Bai Honshin and thus over all Hales. A bright future awaited. And there it is, Honsai, what a nice surprise. I was wondering what to try as a last run before the release of Sarhal and I thought it would be cute to cut my teeth in the time trial mission 3. The campaign was short but very interesting. It's not yet clear to me what the consequences are for obtaining a smaller reward by the time you lose Kao Van Sang. I imagine it's a lesser form of the final government but I don't know for sure. This nation's smaller scope in the region is a bit of a relief and looking back it is so well tooled to govern large colonial nations. But the large distance to any colonial beachheads at this point in time makes the pursuit of colonialism a bit of a stretch. 
I am always glad when I get to find a nation that has genuinely good intentions and Honsai is an example of tough, sometimes horrible, decision making with a genuine good set of intentions behind them. I will be taking my time to enjoy the massive Sarhal expansion after it comes out soon and expect some delay until my next video, but I am very excited to share some of the new adventures in the world of Ambenar as soon as I can. I hope you enjoyed today's story. I thank you for listening and I want to give a special thanks to the Patreons and members who share their warm support. So thank you Depert, Strix2031, Alex, Economics, Generalissimo, Maybe Pigeon, Sam Hendrix, Shredded Paper Plate, Thor's Main, and have a happy late Halloween.